Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Uh, where's the clicker? I've not been here a while, but uh, the clicker is not in the house. And uh, here it comes. It's, I think it's on its way. Uh, wow. So it's good to see your faces. Uh, I've been on sabbatical. You can see you're not used to me being up here. I've been on sabbatical for a while. For those of you who don't know, maybe you've never even seen me preach. I don't know. I've been gone for so long. Um, But I'm back, and I just want to thank everyone up front, you know. Thank you for allowing me to be able to do something like that, allowing me to be able to go to the mountain so I can spend time with the Lord, and I can spend time with my family. Uh, It was really good, and and, and the good news is, is I've come down, and I I don't see a golden calf. So you guys have done good, all right? I never doubted. I never doubted, not for a moment. Well, today we are going to be starting a new series on the Birkat Kohanim. In other words, the priestly blessing, what I'm just simply titling the blessing uh, for this series. We're going to be looking at this for a few weeks. There's a lot here. And really what I'm looking to do is I'm looking to extract the grandeur, the beauty, nay I say the power of this blessing. I'm going to tell you, open your hearts to this series because I promise you this, it will move you. It will move you in awesome ways. And so if this is done right, if you hang with me, open your hearts to the Lord and to his word, uh, you're going to lock mysteries. You're going to lock things in the word that perhaps you've never seen before and understand this blessing in a way you've never understood before. And so I'm I'm very hopeful that this is actually going to be a blessing to you. With that said, we got a lot to cover, so let's get to it. Number six, verse 23, speak to Aharon and his son saying, this is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. I want to stop right here. Notice he does not give Aaron nor Moses the liberty to go out and speak whatever's on their heart. You know, hey, Aaron, go out there, you know, pray for my people. My will is that they're a blessed. But whatever comes on your heart, go ahead and just say that. That doesn't happen here. It doesn't mean we don't have liberty to pray freely and the things that the Holy Spirit puts in our heart. That's a good thing. But what you need to pay attention to here is there's no wiggle room. The Lord is hyper-specific to the words that must be spoken And he is so, you're going to see just how hyper-specific he is in a few minutes. But he's very hyper-specific. And this tells me, before we even look at the blessing, this tells me something about the blessing itself. It tells me it's rooted, it's grounded in power. This is not the mind of Moses. This is not the heart and mouth of Aaron. This is the heart of the living God, and it is his word that is going forth. And one thing I know is it will not fail. There's power in it. So that means as we continue to look at this blessing, we should be hanging on every word that comes forth. You can trust it. You can have assurance that exactly what is being spoken is the truth. And when you do recognize that, when you actually believe that, that's when the transformation comes. That's when the riches of the kingdom of God are unlocked. And so let's take a look at the blessing. And this is what we read. The Lord bless you and keep you. Yeverechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. And then it goes on. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yer Adonai panavalecha v'chonecha. And then it goes on, the last verse. The Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace. Yisa Adonai panavalecha v'yisem lecha. Whether you hear this in Hebrew, whether you hear this in English, I'm going to tell you, it is so powerful. It is so beautiful. It's like this expert harpist plucking the strings and prophesying on the strings, penetrating into your heart. This passage transcends, as Dan was just praying, this passage transcends depression. It transcends anxiety. It transcends anger and bitterness. It transcends all those times you remember you have failed. It transcends fear. These words 
are where it's at. Just listen to them. And it's, it, it, this is the soothing balm that heals the soul. In this generation, and in this time right now, with everything we see happening in the world, you need this. We need the soothing, healing balm of the Lord in his word. And it's what he wants. This is his desire. Now, there is a lot going on here. It's kind of, I get a little crazed because I'm so excited, you know, I just want to, you know, pop the cap off the fire hydrant and blow you out the door. Because it is so rich, there is so much depth here. I, I, I got to calm down. And... I just got to take it slow. We're going to ease into this uh, slowly. And basically what we're going to do here is, and pun intended, I want to dig, dig into this deeper and specifically meaning archaeologically. I want to take you back in history to 1979. It was a good year. I don't know how old I was. It was probably, uh, let's see, uh, five or so, six, something like that. Um, there was a man by the name of Dr. Uh, Gabriel Barkai, right here. And he was on a dig. He's an archaeologist. He's on a dig in Jerusalem's southwest quarter known as Katef Hinnom. And there's burial chambers there. And what ended up happening is, is he stumbled across one of the greatest archaeological discoveries in history. And this is a recent discovery. It was known as today as the Two Silver Scrolls. Well, here's what I want to do. I want to let Dr. Barkai talk to you personally, and let, I'm not going to steal his thunder, and let him uh, explain in detail what exactly he found. After the uh, discoveries made in 1979, the two tiny silver scrolls discovered right behind me here were transferred to the Israel Museum, where they were opened in the lab and they were shown to be covered densely with Hebrew, ancient Hebrew characters. Uh, The characters showed to be the priestly benediction or the Birkat Kohanim, uh, which appears in the Bible in the book of Numbers, Sefer Bamidbar, uh, chapter six, verses 24 and on. Those verses are 2,600 years old according to the shape of characters, according to the context of the uh, archaeological finds, and they are centuries earlier than the oldest biblical verses which were known until then, uh, being the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls found at Qumran. This was the first time that such objects were ever discovered. It was most probably customary in first temple period to wear upon the body on the fingers, on the neck, on the heart, on the wrist, uh, all kinds of written objects with religious texts, very familiar to the tefillin, or the phylacteries, which are known until this very day in Judaism. It would be, of course, interesting to know who was exactly the person who wore upon his body this uh, uh, written object of 2,600 years ago. This discovery of the uh, priestly benediction discovered here uh, closed also a personal circle for me. I was born in the terrible years of Second World War in the ghetto of Budapest, Hungary. In my early days in uh, Hungary, uh, we were used to go to synagogue with my father and when we came home, my father was used to bless me with the words of the priestly benediction. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious to thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Awesome personal touch at the end there of just being able to, this is the first thing I'll touch on, just to be able to break into the reality that what he remembers on, and keep in mind, being in the ghetto, the fond memory of what he has and his interaction with his family was his father praying the Birkat Kohanim over him. Now that is heritage. That is just an awesome thing to see. This is is something that takes back thousands of years and the people of God are still doing it today. What an awesome thing. Now there was one thing that he said 
in this video, and I don't know if you caught it because he didn't emphasize it. You know, typical archaeologists, they kind of just, you know, monotone all the way through. It's massive. It is this. The oldest biblical text we have extent in the world today, right now, are on these two silver scrolls. And I'll put a picture up here so that you can see them. These two silver scrolls and what is embedded on them with the, bear the Birkat Kohanim, the oldest biblical text in existence. Think about that for a second and understand something. And this is important because I'm going somewhere with this. This is a recent discovery. Now, you know how significant the Hebrew Bible is and all the texts that could be on there. And yet, the oldest text, not written on papyri, but written on silver, that which is to last, which is really the only reason we have them today, is the priestly blessing. Now, ponder that in light of what we see happening right now in the world. And what do I mean? Well, there's a recent phenomenon of a worship song known as the blessing. And what is it? It's the Birkat Kohanim. Do you know this song has absolutely went viral, not just in this country, globally. It has been covered more times than I can count. And do you know, I mean, it's been covered by Joshua Aaron in multiple ways. There is people from all around the world that got together to join in to sing this song all over the world. It's unbelievable. And yet it's happening right now. They're singing the priestly blessing. You, you want to think for a moment, why is that? What is going on here? Maybe we should be paying attention to this. Perhaps we've entered into the tribulation and the Lord is encouraging his people. Perhaps he is speaking to them at a level that he spoke to the patriarchs in a time of tribulation and trouble. It's, this is something to ponder. Well, I want to um, take this a step further and I actually want to show you what's on these scrolls. I mean, it's really amazing. Check this out. And this is the first scroll. Yahweh, the great, who keeps the covenant and graciousness towards those who love him and uh, those who keep his commandments, the eternal. You'll notice there's a bunch of brackets and brokenness because they're, they're letting you know that there are some things that are unlegible or unreadable or just simply broken off. Blessing more than any snare and more than evil. Now, there's more here to it, but we need to stop because you need to understand that what we just read is literally, in essence, a direct quote from Daniel 9 in his prayer to God as they are needing to, they're crying out because they're recognizing their sins. It's a horrific situation, but it's what's interesting is Daniel, what is Daniel drawn upon? Daniel is drawn upon Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. You guys got to follow me. You're going to need this. This is, a, this is a direct quote out of the Ten Commandments. The beauty of God that he will keep his covenants with those who love him, keep his commandments. Now listen to what it goes on and says. For redemption is in him, for Yahweh is our restorer and rock. May Yahweh bless you and may he keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine. And the rest of it was broken, but obviously it went on to say and be gracious to you. So get this. Here you have the, the top part talking about keeping his commandments, loving God and keeping his commandments, and then it closes with the Birkat Kohanim, the blessing. Now, think about something. These scrolls, and, and, and again, if you caught what he said, these, these scrolls were being worn as amulets, either bracelets or probably most likely a necklace. And they were inscribed in silver. Now, out of all the text that you could take in Scripture, now, another thing to think about, you want context, these things existed in the days of the great prophets. Jeremiah is walking the earth. Ezekiel is walking the earth. And whoever inscribed these had a multitude of texts from Scripture that they could inscribe in silver. And what they chose was an excerpt Literally, going to the commandments of God, the promises of God that he, if you love him and keep his commandments, he will be gracious, and ending with the Birkat Kohanim. Ponder something. If I was to go to you and say, hey, you got only, and these scrolls are the size of a cigarette butt. You roll them out, and I, and I put the, the dimensions, but it's like one inch by three inches. 
And I told you, hey, you need to go put a verse, a verse on something. I want you to inscribe it in silver. You know what you're going to do? You're going to go home, and the verse that speaks to you the most, that has spoken to your heart, that has transformed your life, that's what you're going to put down. And you need to see this. This is what transformed the Jewish people's lives. This is what they clung to. This is what meant something to them. It was the priestly blessing. Awesome to consider. Let's look at scroll two. May be blessed, and it goes he, she, by Yahweh, the warrior helper. I love that. The rebuker of evil may bless you. Yahweh keep you. May shine Yahweh his face upon you and grant you peace. And so this is, this is what was on these scrolls. When you look at this, this is an amazing. You know what this tells me? This tells me that this text and the Pirkat Kohanim was the elevated text. It was special above all else. And, and let me further prove this point so that you can understand how special this text, was, this text was to the Messianic Jews in the first century. The entire New Testament is filled with it. And, and most people don't realize this, but all of this structure that we read here in the Birkat Kohanim is in the New Testament. I'll give you a couple examples. Paul's writings to the Ephesians, in his opening statement, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Yeshua Mashiach. Undeniable structure right from the Birkat Kohanim. And yet, as he's writing to these churches that are growing, what does he deliver? What is on his heart? What is on his mind? It's the priestly blessing. He opens up with this. He does the same, says the exact same thing with the Philippians. I mean, you can go through, I'm not going to show, I can show you all his epistles, just go through them. And you'll see how heavily he depended on the priestly blessing. It was common, not just common knowledge, it was woven into the tapestry of the faith. Jude, Paul's not the only one. Mercy, in other words, grace, peace. Grace and peace and love be multiplied to you. 1 Peter 1, 2, grace to you and peace be multiplied. And I love John the Revelator. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and is to come. The New Testament is loaded. We can see where this, this text was elevated to the highest of heights. This is the text they were depending on. We depend on this promise, on this truth, on what Aaron and his descendants were to pray over our families, which wasn't Aaron's words, but it was the words of God. This is what they're hanging on. And I'm telling you right now, more than ever, you're going to need to hang on this. And the more we get into this, you're going to understand why. I mean, this is deep stuff. Going back to the blessing Lord bless you and keep you. Lord make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. Now, one thing I can tell you across the board, unanimously, whether we're dealing with Orthodox Jewish scholars, whether we're dealing with Christian scholars, unanimously across the board, they all recognize there is a structure to this blessing. It's overt. It's, it's obnoxiously overt. It's a trumpet blaring in your face. It's so obvious. And there's a reason to it. Well, what is the structure? Well, let's take a look at this. And I've highlighted this for you. But you know what's the first line? The Lord bless you and keep you. That's one stanza. The second stanza. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And then the third part is the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace. Now, what's interesting is when you, when you uh, study Jewish tradition, you, you look to the Talmud and things of that nature, uh, you will recognize that... The, History records that, you know, the Jews say that, okay, in the temple, this blessing was said as one blessing. It was said as one blessing, but go to the dispersion, and what was it said? It was said as three blessings. Now, Christian scholars are geeking out about that, and they should. And the reason is, is because they're looking at this going, wait, they're, the Jews on one hand are calling the blessing echad. They're calling it one. And yet, at the same token, they said, well, we can also call it three. Three blessings. And of course, the, the, the Christian scholars geeking out because of the triune nature of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. 
which is really a fascinating thing. See, because we know there's a governing principle. This is why it's important to see the structure here. There's a governing principle throughout Scripture coming from God himself. On the testimony of two or three, all things are established. All things. That's why you see that here. Now, see, that unveils another level of this to impress upon you what does this mean? What is the weight of this? If, in fact, all things are established on the testimony of two or three, that would tell you this blessing is established. Now, let me give you an example. So as you go to Genesis 50, no, it's not Genesis 50, Genesis 41. Go to Genesis 41, and what you read is Joseph's talking to Pharaoh and said, hey, he's telling him, well, you, you have two dreams, the two dreams are one. But to, you, you were given the dream twice, and then he goes on to say, because the thing is established by God. And then he says, what does it mean? He will surely bring it to pass. It will come to pass. And the fact that we are looking at the Birkat Kohanim here, and God promising, he will bless you. He will keep you. Know this. In this generation that is wicked and evil, he will bring it to pass. What an awesome, talk about hope. Talk about encouragement. You wonder why the Jewish people are clinging onto this? Why they're wearing it as amulets? They're writing it in silver? This is why the testimony of two or three, amazing structure. And you'll notice on each one of these lines, it doesn't go nameless. The holy tetragrammaton is listed in every single one. And it's not just that. Again, this is just, it just keeps blowing your mind. With each tetragrammaton, the holy sacred name of God spoken, there are two following verbs attached again all things established on the testimony of two or three two verbs attached to his glorious name so here we have the lord yahweh or yehovah by some bless you and keep you it's two forms of action the lord well he'll make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and he will lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now this is an amazing now there's no doubt there's no debate that there is a structure here uh, let me take this a step farther. Here we have it. It looks so beautiful in the Hebrew, don't it? I mean, it is beautiful, and it's even more beautiful to receive it, to actually hear those words spoken and, and get into your heart. But check this out. So, you know, and I'm not a numbers geek either, but these mathematicians, they will tell you that, you know what? Prime numbers are the sacred numbers of God. This is, this is something people have talked about, okay? Prime numbers are the sacred number of God, and this is what's crazy. You'll notice the first line. Oh, let me start here. Notice when you lay this out in Hebrew, it, is sta- it actually forms a mountain. It forms a mountain, and you think that you're Shalim, and you literally have the name of God coming down the mountain. It's, it's kind of crazy. I mean, we can go as crazy as you want. We're not going to. But... Uh, you can be as inventive as you want, and, and I don't hang on all these, but this is really amazing, okay? So you can kind of see God coming down the mountain. I mean, this is pretty amazing, but three, five, seven. Three Hebrew words, five Hebrew words, seven Hebrew words, all prime numbers, every single one of them, and everybody's left scratching the head going, wow, you know, the prime numbers have been considered to be the sacred. They're indivisible. See, that's what makes a prime number prime. It's indivisible. Isn't that crazy? And what is the first prime number? Well, it's two. It's the only even number in the existence of numbers that is prime. And and you go back to this whole concept. All things are established on the testimony of uh, two or three. It begins with a prime number. God's establishing begins with a prime number. He's a God of math. And he's much, you know, you dig into this stuff and I just... I just go, God, I'm going to leave it to the point where you are so far beyond your wisdom, so far beyond searching out and actually obtaining. I'll just, whatever you give me, praise the Lord. Uh, But this is just, you know, stuff like this, you're like, I I can't believe it. And you listen to astrophysicists talk about this who who are coming to the knowledge of saying, well, no, we know mathematically speaking, there is a creator. I mean, they're coming to this knowledge. It's so crazy how brilliant our God is. I don't think we really grasp it sometimes uh, in our little minds. Moving on, there's more I want to cover. This is something I think is important to bring to the table, and that is how 
the priest would say the blessing. Again, you can go to the Talmud, and there's a lot of conversation on this, but I'm going to give you the crux of it. The priest would say it in the following manner. They would say it while standing, okay? And actually, you would never see a priest bless the people while sitting. You've never seen me come up here behind the beam at the end of the service and, and bless in the beer kakonim while sitting down. It's not going to happen because it's to be done standing. And it's not just done standing, but you're to go to the duchan. You're, you're to come to an elevated position, a platform. And from a platform being elevated, you're to go out and bless the children of Israel. The second thing is, and this is important, okay? This is vitally important that you keep this because you're going to need it at the end of the day. It said face to face. A priest doesn't turn his back on the one he is blessing. It has to be said face to face. Third, it was spoken loudly, not in a hushed tone, as you would see part of, uh, uh, you know, the Jewish liturgy is done. Some of it's done on a, it's not done in a hushed tone. All people must hear it. And actually, it wasn't just spoken loudly. It was actually chanted. As they go back, they really believe going back to temple times, it was done similarly to how we do it now. We sing it. You chant it. Uh, number four, it's very adamant as you go to the Talmud, it be said in Hebrew. And then five is this, and I want to spend a little bit of time on this. They said it with their hands stretched out. Their hands were raised and we have a great example of this in Leviticus 9.22. Then Aaron lifted his hand toward the people. And what's he do? He blesses them. Now, one of the cool things about this, traditionally speaking, is that the Jewish people recognized when the priest went to the Duchan, when he took the platform, and he spoke the words of the living God, and he stretched out his hands, they knew the power of God came down. Now, check this out. Jewish Encyclopedia records, the belief prevailed that during the lifting up of the hands, the priest, uh, by the priest, the Shekinah, which is the glory of God, was hovering over their heads and its rays streamed through their open fingers. Now, you think about that for a second. Now, here's the deal, just for a moment. Slide that aside. Everything I know about the Birkat Kohanim I know it is anointed by the power of God. And when someone goes up according to his will and doesn't speak their words, but they speak the words of God, they are operating in anointing. And you better believe the Ruach is going to move. He's going to go out. And this is powerful. Now you think about, you can go to the prayer of Habakkuk. Go to the prayer of Habakkuk. He literally talks about the rays coming forth from the hands of God in his power. The ultimate uh, Cohen Gadol, amen. Now, I don't want to just cover this. There's another aspect I want to cover to the priest saying the blessing, and that is the timing. So now we're getting into some serious substance, some serious revelation. What do they say today? Timing is everything, right? Yes, it's timing is everything. When the priest said this, let's go back to Leviticus. 922. I want to show you something. Here's what it says. Aaron lifted his hand toward the people, blessed them, and came down from offering the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offerings. Here's, understand what you just heard. What just happened is, is literally he offered the sin sacrifice and the following sacrifice, and the next thing he does is go out, stretches out his hands, and he blesses his people, blesses the people of God. In that order. And Jewish tradition understands that the blessing, the Bir Kakonim, was said after the daily sacrifices. Go back to the temple times. After the daily sacrifices, that's what the priest would do. Sacrifice the lamb. Now you go and bless the people. Do you really believe this is a coincidence? That this specific order is structured in such a way? I don't. Let's look at what Paul says. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, Now in Messiah Yeshua, you who were once afar off have been brought near. Oh, how? By the blood of Christ. For he himself is our what? He's our shalom. He's our shalom. Ve'yaseim lecha shalom. I mean, this is in the priest. And you'll get this. We're talking about the sacrifice. Because of the sacrifice of Christ, what do we have now? 
we have the blessing. We have the same lecha shalom. That's what we have. Ephesians 1, chapter 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, Messiah Yeshua, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You get it. No sacrifice, no blessing. What do you think the Torah is testifying of? What do you think the temple services were testifying of? Day after day after day. Yeshua tells us, if you believe Moses, you would believe me. He wrote about me. We should go read what Moses wrote. And we should look for Yeshua. He's, he's all over the place. And man, you want to talk about unearthing. Do you want to hit the crescendo moment? Do you want to have the deep riches of the Most High God as you go to his word? Find Yeshua. That's the crescendo. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he is not kidding. He is all in all. He is everything. And that's when you come to that moment of purity, of pure understanding, of clarity, where the veil is literally removed because you're in the Messiah, Yeshua. One more passage we're sharing. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. What are we talking about? Sacrifice. Paul knows what I'm talking about right now. The sacrifice. And what's he say next? He says this, that the blessing... Because of the sacrifice that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Messiah Yeshua, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You want to talk about unpacking an incredible revelation of the priestly blessing? And about the timing of it? About the order of it? Paul knows how to do it. Understand the blessing is directly tied to the sacrifice. Directly tied. No sacrifice, no blessing. It's that simple. Luke 23, we read about Yeshua being crucified. We read about the sacrifice. Luke 24 is his resurrection. And he goes out and he shows himself to his disciples. Do you ever read what happened? Well, this is what we'll read. Check this out. Now, as they said these things, Yeshua himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Oh, shalom, peace. First he sacrificed, then he comes to them and says, Shalom. And then we read in 50, he led them out as far as Bethany. Oh, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Mind blowing. The sacrifice took place. And the first thing you read about as he goes and meets with his disciples, as the Kohen Gadol, what you would expect him to do as the priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, to go forth and bless his disciples. I want to take you to Genesis 12 because I don't want to just talk about the timing of when the priest did this. I want to talk about the timing of when this blessing began because you can go to number 623 in subsequent verses and you can say, okay, yeah, you know, here's, here's where we're instructed. You know, the priests are instructed to bless and this is where it all begins. That's not where it begins. It begins back in Genesis 12. And is this important? You better believe it's important. For understanding the blessing and what is entailed with this blessing, this is important. So we're going to go back. Now the Lord had said to Avram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. Oh, I will bless you. We learn so much about the Birkat Konim right here, about the blessing. God asked Abraham to do something. You want the blessing? You know what you got to do? You got to abandon your family, okay, that you're accustomed to. You're all your friends. You have to leave your home. Your inheritance surely would have become Abraham's in through it and being inherited by his fathers and his father's father. He would have had that. You have to abandon your gods, your idols that you have in Ur of Chaldea. All these gods that your family's worth. You have literally, Abraham was being ripped out of everything he was accustomed to, everything he knew, everything that was comfortable to him. His life was flipped upside down. You know, I've heard these words before. Kind of by Yeshua when he says, unless you deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow me, you'll never see eternal life. That's what we're being called to do. That's calling began with Abraham. 
What was the motivation? Okay, so the Lord comes to him and says, hey, you, know, you got to leave everything. I mean, how many of you are just going to up and go, yeah, you know, you know what? It says it's a land I will show you. I will show you. Not, you have seen. It'd be much easier if Abraham had seen what he was going to and can confirm, oh yeah, God, he's not leading me astray. No, Abraham has no idea where he's going. He has no idea what's there. He has to just trust the Lord, right? What's the motivation? The blessing. The blessing. The blessing is the motivation. What did Abraham do? He left. What does that tell you about Abraham and the blessing? He wanted it. He wanted it more than anything. He was willing to give everything for the blessing of God. Man, you want to talk about a mind-blowing heart. This is the heart. No wonder God picked Abraham to bring about such blessings to the nations. Now, continuing, it goes on and says this. He says, and I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. So God's blessing upon Abraham is so awesome, it would impact the world. I think God knows how to bless, amen? Now, verse three, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you all. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Let me ask you a question. Because again, we got to understand the blessing. How does this happen? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, your, your blessing is going to be so great, but you're going to bless everyone. You're going to bless all the nations. How does that happen? Well, we already read it. Paul already told us it happens through the Messiah, Yeshua. No other way. There is no other way this happens. And so it keeps coming back as we're looking at the blessing. Yeshua is the center of attention. I love what Paul says in uh, Galatians 3.29. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Then you are. See, you want the blessing that we're talking about? You're going to have to believe what Abraham believed. And you're going to have to do what Abraham did. And I love what Yeshua says to the Jews in John chapter 8. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works that Abraham did. So, you know, so often what we want is we just want the blessing. You don't want to pick up your cross to go follow Yeshua, to go get it. The blessing's available, but it comes at a price. Everything that your heart, your fleshly heart loves in this world, every idol you've, you've set up has to be brought down. I want to take you back to Genesis. And we're going to go to the life of Jacob. Here we are, uh, and I, I didn't even plan this. I assure you, I had totally, I didn't even know what the Torah portion was today. Forgive me. Um, but uh, we're going to go to the Torah portion. In Genesis 25, verse 29 You want to talk about more veil being ripped off here. Now, Yaakov cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore, his name was called Adom. Now, I want to dissect this a little bit so that you understand what's going on. Mike did a great job today. Uh, We're going to come at this a little differently. Um, First thing I want to to do is, is say this. What you are reading right now is a prophetic template of the end times. And then you can even find this stuff in the Apocrypha as well. This is, the, this is not just a story of history. This is a prophetic typology between good and evil, between the faithful and the unfaithful. You understand? And specifically, and listen to me clearly, Esau is a typology of the believers that will fall away in the tribulation. He is a typology of that. He, and, and, and Paul even talks about this in his letter to Timothy, talking about that now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Okay, Esau is the typology of that. Now with that said, let's, let's go to this. Now Jacob cooked a stew and Esau came in from the field. Isn't it interesting that When you look at how Yeshua uses the term field in his parable, it's a reference to the world. But then it goes on and says, and he was weary. In other words, he came in from the field, the world, and he was weary. He was exposed to the world, and he's got nothing left. 
This guy, what do we read in Daniel 7? We read that the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, the devil comes forth and he seeks to wear out the saints of the Most High. This is his focus. He's going forth to wear out the saints of the Most High. And we are seeing this right here. That's absolutely amazing. And, and I'll just I'll, I'll address one thing and we'll continue. Um, Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew. What does Esau want? He's weary. He's got nothing left. His life's hanging by a thread. He wants the stew. That's what he wants. He's yearning for that. Now in the Hebrew, it's ha-adom, ha-adom. Ha-adom, ha-adom. But it's interesting because as it goes on, it's a play on words. Then they called him Adom. Red stew in the Hebrew, ha-adom, ha-adom. And then they call his name Adom. That's a play on words. And what you need to take away from that is get this. His choice to select the red stew was, yes, the very name that he would be called by and his descendants would be called by, the Edomites. That was by his decision is his identity now. Think about that. You hold the line, you become faithful as we're going to see Jacob is. Guess what your identity is? It is the Messiah Yeshua. I mean, this is, this is an awesome text. Now, continuing verse 31, this is what we read. But Yaakov said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. What is this birthright to me? Listen, this is an antichrist moment. This is the moment that Esau is confronted with. You have the ability to hold the line or whether you compromise and give in. Esau's feeling the heat. You look at this, he's in despair, he's hanging by a thread, and all of a sudden, guess what? And this is what's really important. Esau all of a sudden has a perspective on the birthright that he may have not had before or even realized. See, before, he, he never sold his birthright for another, but when trial and tribulation, affliction and anguish, persecution comes... Now all of a sudden, I, I don't value that as much as I thought. Who cares? My, I'm going to die in the flesh. Unbelievable. I mean, this is where we're at. And so he no longer values his soul. He no longer values salvation. He's willing to sell it for a brief moment of comfort, of temporary satisfaction. And I'm going to tell you right now, we are living in days or we're going to have antichrist moments. They are coming, and they're coming hard. Now, let's go to the flip side. Let's go to the side that we want to be on. When you look at the life of Jacob, his heart, what did he value? What was in his heart? What did he want more than anything? The birthright. He wanted the birthright. Why? Did he need recognition? Did he need the recognition of this birthright which was given to the firstborn so that he could walk around and say, look at me? What did he want? What is it about the birthright that's important? Well, the writer of Hebrews covers it in chapter 12. It's the blessing. So here we go. I mean, this is where it circles back to the Birkat Kohanim. Jacob wanted the blessing. And make no mistake, because we can see this here. You can read into the text. He was looking for any advantage, any moment that he could go in and get it. It's all he wanted. And he was able to get it. Now let's jump ahead. This gets even more incredible. In Genesis thirty-two twenty-four. 24, then Yaakov was left alone. And a man, which as you know, Mike talked about that today. There's no question. It's Yeshua. And I don't, I'm not going to get into the deepness of that. I just want to stay focused here. A man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. How, how much do you, what do you think that would feel like to have your socket knocked out of joint like that? I mean, that, I don't care who you are. You, there's no way you can paint this in another light. You're going to feel that. At the end of the day, this is serious. And he did it so that he would let him go. I mean, so it was, an, it was enough. This wasn't a little, you know, I'll just push you so you get off of me type of situation. No, this was a blow. Look at what is said next. 
Absolutely incredible. And he said, let me go. This is Yeshua. For the day breaks. But Yaakov said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I will not. What does Jacob want? There's nothing else he wants but the blessing. Here's a guy that has his, his hip knocked out of the socket. And you would think, I'm not going to let you go till you fix this. Fix what's going on here. He never asks. He only has one thing on his mind. That's the beer cot koanim. I want the blessing. He valued it. He valued the blessing. Let me ask you something. Are you clinging to the Lord with the same might and the same heart asking for the blessing and saying, I'm not letting you go to give me the blessing? Or do you, you throw a five-minute prayer at Yeshua and hope for the best? I'm telling you right now, this is, this is how you get it done. This is how the Birkat Kohanim comes alive in your life. This is where blessing comes. It's clinging to the garment of Yeshua. There's no other way. And this is so incredibly revelatory for me just to see this, to see how Jacob acts and what he cares about. I think of Yeshua's words in Matthew 13, 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, what did he do? He went out and sold all that he had. It's the only thing that matters. See, when you find the Lord, when, when you find the Lord in the blessing, you will sell everything for the blessing. There's no question about it. You'll give everything you can for God's blessing. Now, going back, Genesis 32, 26. I will not let you go unless you bless me. Let's see how this carries out. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Yaakov. And he said, your name shall no longer be Yaakov, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. That only happened because he didn't let go. It only happened because all he wanted was the blessing. Verse 29. Then Yaakov asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? Uh, we could go on and talk about that. That's a Yeshuaism, if you will. Um, but I won't get into that. But then I will say this. And he blessed him there. Jacob got the blessing. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God, oh, face to face. Hallelujah. How does the priest, when they say the blessing over the people, it is face to face. And here we see that's exactly how it's done. Now, let's take this one step further. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, I call on heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death. Oh, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life that you, both you and your descendants may live. Notice, blessing and life are used mutually used in the same context. They refer to one another, okay? If I'm saying I want the blessing, I am saying I want life. What does that tell you about the Birkat Kohanim? This is important because when we go, I, and Jacob wanted the blessing, uh, is it just simply, well, make sure you have food on my table. And certainly that's a blessing and certainly we ask for that. Do you think that's the extent of what the Birkat Kohanim is talking about? It is talking about eternal life. Do you want the blessing or not? That's the question. We're told, choose. So now you can have a priest go up and stretch out his hands. You can have the rays of the living God come out from his fingers, the Ruach HaKodesh, go all over the place. But I'm going to tell you right now, it will not fall on you if you do not choose this day whom you will serve. It won't happen. You want the blessing? Don't let go. You want the blessing? Choose life. Verse 20. That you may love the Lord your God that you may obey his voice. In other words, you have to keep his commandments. Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know what's crazy about the word? It's just like, can I just go to the word for five minutes and not talk about the commandments? Is that just possible? Because I just want to talk about the blessing. I just want to talk about, I can't. I've tried. 
You can't do it. It's like everywhere I go, I'm confronted with the commandments. Maybe that's why he said you're to talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. This is like ridiculous. It doesn't stop. Why? Because it is life and death. And because I'm hard-headed. And we're stubborn by nature. Are we not stubborn and rebellious by nature? Are we not stiff-necked by nature? God doesn't stop. You know, if, you know when, and it's all on me, people, but when I do stuff in the house that I know I'm not supposed to do and my wife's like on me, she doesn't stop. And that's the only way it gets done. It's quite humorous. It works. The Lord knows what he's doing. Now get this. This is awesome. That you may love the Lord your God and that you may obey his voice. You must keep his voice. Now what's it say? That you may cling to him. Isn't that interesting? What did Jacob do? He clung to Yeshua. He would not let him go. Now, now get this. Here it's specifically talking about for us to cling to him, I can't ever let go of the commandments of God. I have to hold them. I have to walk them out. I have to keep them. You want the blessing? You can't let go. You can't do it. Deuteronomy 28 verse 1. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to carefully uh, uh, observe, to observe carefully all its commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Verse 2, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Now, taking you back to Katafinom, scroll one, the silver scroll. And perhaps you will appreciate this scroll and how carefully they thought about what was to go on that silver scroll. What was on there? If you remember, two things were on there. It talked about how God is gracious to those who keep his commandments and love him. Oh, and the beer caught Kohanim. Isn't that amazing? Because as this passage that we just went through, we recognize Jacob wouldn't let go of Yeshua. And as we continue in the Torah, To cling to him, to continue to cling to him, we have to keep his commandments. And that's exactly what was on that silver scroll. That's why my mind is blown. that, that That was inspiration of the Holy Spirit taking the most critical text you could possibly take and ones that give you a future and ones that encourage you and ones that give you hope and donning that, adorning that. We're gonna close 